Did anyone else get coal in their stockings this year, or was that just me? Today's video is brought to you by Manscaped and the Performance Package 4.0. It may be winter time here in the Northern Hemisphere, but that doesn't mean you should let nature reclaim the land. With Manscaped, you'll have all the right tools to keep your season looking bright. The Lawnmower 4.0 is IP67 rated, so you can cut around the tree even if the weather outside is frightful. The included wireless charger also means it's ready to go whenever you are. You'll also get the Weed Whacker 2.0 to take care of any ear and nose hair, which helps me avoid that father time look in my mid-30s. I'm personally a big fan of the Crop Reviver for keeping your balls clean, as well as the Crop Preserver for keeping them dry. With Manscaped, you can make sure your ornaments keep looking like they're hung with care. Go to manscaped.com slash craftcomputing to get 20% off, free international shipping, plus two additional free gifts. That's manscaped.com slash craftcomputing, and remember, your balls will thank you. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Recently, I've been a pretty vocal critic of Microsoft and the direction of Windows as both a consumer and business-focused operating system. As Windows moves closer and closer to a platform-as-a-service model, the number of problems inherent with that model keeps increasing. From the constant reminders to sign up for OneDrive or Office 365, both paid services for Microsoft, to games loaded with microtransactions installed onto your PC from the highest bidder, to Microsoft using telemetry within their own OS to deliver advertisements, the PC has been less and less yours every single day. Sure, you may still own the hardware, but gone are the days of complete customization and control over your operating system. But Microsoft has figured out that they can get away with it because it's not like you're going to jump ship over to Linux or Mac OS. And before you chime in down in the comments about how you switched to Linux nearly two decades ago and never looked back, you were 1% of the market share then and you're 1% of the market share now. No one is switching in numbers large enough to make Microsoft scared enough to change their current practices. So. That's it then. Let's pack it up and just assume this is how computing is going to be from now on. That is, unless something comes out of nowhere and provides us with a different option. But what if I told you there have been bloatware-free alternative builds of Windows that date back to before the bloat in Windows even began? That there have been clean versions of Windows XP, Windows 7, 10, and even 11 free from pre-installed applications, data collection, useless services, and shameless plugs for other products in Microsoft's catalog? Now. What if I told you that those versions were from Microsoft themselves? But before you get out your credit card or set sail in your browser for friendlier waters, keep in mind that these versions of Windows were never intended for general computing. Rather, most of these are for enterprise or single-purpose PCs, and likely require management and maintenance well beyond that of a normal Windows install. And, like I said, Microsoft won't sell these to you. At least, not without selling you a volume license agreement first, with a minimum number of SKUs and annual licensing to keep everything working. In other words, they'll sell these versions to large businesses, but not to you. So, sit back, relax, grab a pint, and let's walk through the four versions of Windows OS's that Microsoft won't sell you. Starting all the way back where the SKU confusion began with Windows XP. In the 90s, there was really only one version of Windows for consumers. Windows 95, 98, and Millennium were all built on top of DOS, while server and business PCs ran versions of Windows based on the NT kernel instead. While features between, say, Windows NT4 and Windows 98 were similar, they were very different operating systems under the hood. It wasn't until Windows XP that Microsoft merged these code bases together, and had both consumer and business OS's run on the same kernel. Windows XP was not only the first consumer operating system to eliminate DOS as an underpinning, running instead on the NT kernel, but it was also available in two different SKUs, Home and Professional Editions. The main difference between the two was the ability to join an Active Directory server and use group policies to define settings on the local machine. A professional license was also needed for multi-CPU systems. There were two other versions of Windows XP, though, that not many people knew about. There was Windows XP Embedded, an operating system designed to run a single application or run as a simple and lightweight server. You've likely used Windows XP Embedded and not known about it, as it was popular in ATMs, digital signage, small business servers, as well as a wide range of other industrial uses. XP Embedded was mainly designed to run single applications and not used for general computing. Most embedded installs I've come across don't even have the standard Windows GUI, that is the start menu and desktop actually being removed from the OS. Only the intended application and its dependencies would be allowed to run. 
But there's one more window SKU that is even more obscure. So obscure, in fact, that I've never knowingly seen it in the wild. It doesn't even use the Windows XP name, opting instead for Windows Fundamentals for Legacy PCs. I guess the marketing team was taking that day off. While still being based on the Windows XP embedded build, Windows FLP, as it was known, was designed to be a general purpose operating system, but with lower minimum hardware requirements, as the name might imply. The variant didn't come with any fanfare when it launched in September 2006, getting only a footnote in a Microsoft press release. It was also never intended to be a consumer operating system, instead being aimed at Windows 95 and 98 based business machines that hadn't yet been updated to Windows XP. So what is the difference between Windows FLP and Windows XP Professional? Both are able to join Active Directory domains, and both can be configured with group policy. But FLP does have an interesting quirk. Microsoft Internet Explorer is an optional install. That's right, even though Explorer is the main GUI application that loads your desktop and start menu, Internet Explorer can actually be excluded without consequence in this operating system. Beyond the collection of services that are normally turned on, but are disabled by default in FLP to save on hardware resources, there's not much that isn't included in this release. According to Wikipedia, FLP does not include Paint, Outlook Express, or the default Windows games, so no Solitaire or Space Cadet Pinball. There's also no compatibility mode for spoofing previous versions of Windows when programs are explicitly looking for Windows 95 or Windows 98. Like a large portion of Windows' modern SKUs intended for businesses, Windows FLP was only made available to business customers with software assurance licenses. Essentially, rather than purchasing a single perpetual Windows license, as you would for a home or professional edition, this agreement would license versions of Windows on an annual basis, but with the benefit of coming with a free upgrade any time there was a new release. But to get a software assurance agreement, you have to have a minimum number of staff or a minimum number of computers that you will be licensing. And like I said, it is an annual agreement and you are beholden to the licensing requirements in those contracts. So why would Microsoft even make an operating system like this? Well, while Windows XP isn't exactly the most bloated operating system ever, keep in mind that the minimum requirements for it were only a Pentium processor running at 233 MHz with MMX technology. While it was very possible to run Windows XP on PCs that are this slow, even at that time, there would still be some major benefits to having a stripped-down version, especially as a business. Though, I'm thinking if gamers would have known about this option about 20 years ago, it may have drawn their interest as well. Since no one talks about Windows Vista, I'm going to honor that practice and move straight on to Windows 7. Again, there were home and professional versions designed to separate those who needed Active Directory from those who don't. However, there was also the added slap in the face to enthusiasts by limiting the maximum system RAM to 16GB with Windows 7 Home Premium, needing a professional or higher SKU to take advantage of more. Of course, Microsoft did offer a stripped-down version of Windows 7 Home called Windows 7 Home Basic and Windows 7 Starter. The, well, basic idea of it was to entice you to buy a Windows 7 Home Premium license by disabling the Aereo Glass UI, not being able to create home area networks for sharing documents and files, and the removal of Windows Media Center. Windows 7 Starter was nerfed even harder, with support for things like multiple monitors, fast user switching, and games all being removed, as well as only being available in a 32-bit variant and having a maximum of 2GB of RAM. There is, however, another SKU that comes with nearly every service and feature disabled out of the box, but with the ability to install them as needed. In 2011, Microsoft released Windows Thin PC, a version of Windows 7 based on Windows 7 embedded with Service Pack 1. Just like Windows 7 Starter, ThinPC is a 32-bit only operating system designed for use with older hardware. ThinPC increases the memory limit to 3GB, so this isn't exactly an OS where they had gaming in mind. Rather, it's supposed to be a drop-in replacement for hardware that was still running Windows XP. While it is much more locked down than Windows FLP, for instance the Windows Feature Installer is completely unavailable, it will still run any application you're able to throw at it so long as the dependencies are available. And finally, we enter the modern era with Windows 10 and Windows 11. True to form, Microsoft has muddied the waters even further with their SKU names and feature lists, and made it even harder to determine which version of Windows fits your use case. Obviously, as both a creative professional and a gamer, I want the most streamlined version of Windows that I can get. If you ask Microsoft, that would be Windows 10 Professional, even though I clearly did not ask for Candy Crush, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and nearly every other third-party application that comes pre-installed in this version. At least with Professional, you can remove them and they almost never come back. With Home, they'll just keep reinstalling themselves. 
The version of Windows 10 that I've been using for the last handful of years has been LTSC, or the Long-Term Servicing Channel Builds. Again, this is technically only available to enterprise customers who have software assurance licensing, and I certainly don't qualify for that, so how am I running it? To buy a Windows 10 LTSC license, you just have to find a customer who is willing to sell them to you. While Microsoft claims this is against the terms of their license, the EU and US courts have both determined otherwise, allowing the resale of software licenses without the copyright holder's permission. That means if Microsoft sells an LTSC license to a third party, that third party can then resell the use of that license to another third party, like me. Now, getting an LTSC license used to be as easy as jumping onto eBay, searching for LTSC, and paying anywhere from $2 to $5 for a product key. It seems that one party or another cracked down on that practice in the last couple years, though. Anymore, the best place to find them is on CD key websites, none of which I'm going to endorse here. So what makes LTSC different from the home or professional versions you're likely running right now? First and foremost, it's an OS that comes with only first-party software installed. Now, it may still come with features that you want to disable, like Cortana or OneDrive, but it's not going to come with Netflix or Roblox pre-installed in your start menu either. Secondly, it's an operating system that only receives regular security updates. Feature updates are only released with new major OS revisions, so the look and feel of your OS isn't going to change drastically just because you restarted your PC one night. Since it's technically an enterprise operating system, you can join an Active Directory domain, modify group policy, and there are no memory or CPU socket limits for the hardware you install it on. And finally, we come to the modern day with Windows 11. Now I will say, Windows 11 doesn't appear as bloated as Windows 10, at least in the first couple months of use. Either that, or we've just all become numb to all the pre-installed applications and calls to action to purchase Microsoft's cloud services. But at this point, Windows 11 doesn't seem to have an equivalent stripped down version. While there is an enterprise SKU and a workstation professional SKU, they both include third-party applications and slots sold to the highest bidder. Yes, I know they're easier to disable in these versions of Windows, but those are still steps that the user or enterprise has to take that shouldn't be present in enterprise and professional applications. And one final note before we go, just this last month, Microsoft released the fourth revision of Windows 10 LTSC, and it will likely be the last for that operating system. Thus far, they have been silent on any potential LTSC releases of Windows 11. So in the meantime, you'll just have to wait and see if there continues to be an option for those wanting a more professional desktop environment. Or you might just need to continue running dbloat scripts that you find on GitHub and YouTube. And before you ask, no, I will not be providing any download links to these operating systems down in the video description. You'll need to find those on your own. But you can go down there and find a link to craftcomputing.store to pick yourself up a pint glass or a t-shirt and start drinking like a pro. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me when I do, consider joining the Patreon. The link is down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Here for today is Cole from CNEM Brewing right here in Salem, Oregon, a 6.2% porter with 28 IBU. But this has a really thick head that puffs up quite a bit right at first and then dissipates quickly, but then stops right about there. And honestly, that's about perfect if you're pouring yourself a pint. I'm getting a very, very light maltiness to this. Think like a, a puffed rice or something thereabouts. Yeah, and that light, slightly bitter, slightly roasted flavor kind of continues all the way back. Uh, not an overly complex beer, and I really didn't expect it to be for, what is this, 6.2%? Yeah, 6.2. Uh, not offensive, pretty solid dark beer. Great option if you're looking for something that's not an imperial barrel age stout. <laughs> Final thoughts on this one. Not an overly complex beer. Uh, as it warms up a little bit, there's some really pleasant notes, like a little bit of marshmallow, like I said, right off the bat, kind of that puffed rice maltiness without being too artificial. Now, this is not a beer that's going to make you sit down and think and, and dive into the complexities of it. It kind of is what it is, but what it is, is a pretty solid porter.